Welcome to Good Game. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. Well, Bajo, we've reached that time of year where AAA games are a little light on the ground, but it does give us an excuse to check out some more unusual and left of field titles. Yes, we certainly have some creative games this week, including a point and click investigation with a passion for strawberry bubblegum. Uh, are you okay? Also this week, we dive into a player-driven economy in a new MMO. I just can't recraft any of this gear. I bought it well from auction house. Oh yes, get yourself a heel jacket, bro. And we look at two mobile titles, one that's all about precision and accuracy, and another which is a game of the mind. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? Here's what's making headlines. A man in the United States has found what may be the only remaining prototype of the Super Nintendo PlayStation. The console was designed as part of a short-lived partnership between the two companies to create a disc-based Nintendo console in the mid-90s, a partnership that publicly fell apart which led Sony to create the PlayStation console on their own. 200 prototypes were originally created but all were thought to have been destroyed. Dan Diebold found the prototype in his attic after his father apparently smuggled it home after being asked to throw it away. Dan hasn't yet turned the console on as he needs a new power supply for it, but there's a mysterious cartridge and disc waiting for him to try once he does. Julius Kivimaki, a 17-year-old member of the hacking group Lizard Squad, has been convicted of over 50,000 instances of cybercrime. The Finnish teen, also known as Zekill, had claimed responsibility for last year's denial of service attacks on Xbox Live and PlayStation Network. His punishment includes a two year suspended prison sentence and the requirement to advocate against cybercrime. And in sad news, Nintendo president and CEO Satoru Iwata has died at the age of 55. From his early days as a programmer to the innovation he brought as president, Iwata won our eternal respect. On my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer, but in my heart, I am a gamer. For 90% of human history, we were hunter-gatherers, heading out into the wild to forage for food instead of growing it. It was only about 10,000 years ago that we started farming, which is also about how long it takes to grow a farm in Albion Online. <gasps> Carrot seeds. Why do people run? Soon, we will feast <laughs> on the sweet deliciousness of these carrots. Gonna get me. Oh no! <laughs> Albion Online is a game which has nothing to do with the Fable series. It's an economy-based hunting, gathering, farming, PvP, sandbox MMO currently in alpha. Oh, that's quite a mouthful. Yeah, accurate though. Yeah, this is a seriously large and deep MMO and quite unlike anything we've ever played before. At first, I wasn't sure quite what to make of this, Bajo. I just thought it looked a bit too simple, a bit like a browser-based MMO. But this really is a unique and interesting game for a few reasons. Yeah, there's a lot to it, isn't there? From the economy within the game to how you choose to spend your time in it. And you also need to play with others. You're not going to get very far solo. It is also, without a doubt, one of the grindiest MMOs I've ever played. And this may not be a bad thing for some because of the type of game that it is, but you can't deny that that progress is slow going. You begin by being dumped into a little city with pretty much no guidance. It takes a few hours before you get to grips with how progression works. It really does leave things up to you, but I like that. That's the core of the game, really, freedom. You can choose what you want to do in it, but you have to work for it. Yeah, absolutely. I love how immediately you get a sense of how busy this game is. The first village you come to is thriving. You can see the economy of the game in front of you as everyone is working hard to gear up and live. Initially, Hex, I spent the first few hours of this game just being envious of everyone with a horse. I want, I want the horse. Why do they have horses? I want it. The world is just so big and my bag is so small. Oh, I just want a horse so bad. Yeah, me too. Or at least like an ox or something to carry all of my junk. Yes, but alas, we could never afford one. And anything in this game worth having is hard earned. Basically, your first goal should be to head out to the forest, gather wood and stone, make some basic tools, head out again, gather more, approach trickier enemies and hopefully not die. How do I get back to the road? Just critted me. Something hardcore. 
Death is really bad. It is. If you die, you get a massive durability hit to your gear and you lose some of your gathered materials. But if gear gets too damaged, it just turns to trash. Useless, pathetic trash with a horrible trash font just to make you feel like trash. Yeah, that font is horrible. I, I love hate this hex. There was one point where I died twice in a no, row. No, no, no. No, no, no. And you know, that was pretty bad. I lost some stuff. But then as I got up and was trying to make my way back to town, I clicked a non-aggressive fox no. by mistake. <laughs> nah. And bam, three times in a row and I lost everything, all my weapons, all my gear. And of course then comes the walk of shame. Hey mate, yep, had a rough time in the woods. See you later. Ah yes, the walk of shame, back to town. No gear, no clothes. No respect. <laughs> it is quite depressing. Hex, I like that there's not a traditional class system in this game. Yeah, the gear that you're wearing is your class. Use a sword and shield and you're a warrior with a few warrior abilities. Use a staff and shield. You might get a protection spell from the shield, but you're really a wizard casting fireballs. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the leather chest piece myself, Hex, because it comes with a regening health ability. And that comes in really handy because regening health in this game is so slow outside of combat. Yeah, the devs really need to speed up that health regen. I like that you can build a hybrid class, but it's not the best use of your time to be spreading your focus on multiple clothing types because you just don't have the time to learn how to craft everything. I mean, check out this unlock tree called the Destiny Board. That's big. Yeah, looking at it actually upsets me, Hex. <laughs> and it's a little confusing about what you can unlock and what unlocks automatically. I, need to craft, I just need to craft mage gear like crazy. I don't think you'll ever be able to fill it all out. And I think for this game, you really have to pick a direction and go. You know, if you want to be a farmer, pick that and go from it right from the start. If you want to be a weaponsmith or make cloth, just one thing and go hard at it. Yeah, that's <laughs> your role in the world yeah. and in a guild. And you want to be in a good guild that know what they're doing. The mechanics and design ideas behind Albion Online want you to take part in the economy of the world and help teammates around you. I mean, you want a job, basically, in this player-structured society. Yeah, and you'll want to join a guild that has jobs set up already. Maybe they need a weaponsmith. Maybe you can be that person. Yeah, sadly, we weren't able to test out what it's like being in a guild with our limited alpha time, and likewise with PvP. This is also a territory power struggle game. Guilds can claim actual land in the world and cultivate it. And, of course, defend it from rival guilds. Tying in PvP with actual territory and gear makes for high stakes gaming. Housing is a big part of this game as well, and I was able to do a little bit of it. I bought myself a private island. I'm home. Put down a farm, which of course needs mats to build fully. Oh, uh, what? I need wood and stone. And then upkeep apparently as well. But I grew some carrots. There we go. I'm gonna grow the crap out of these carrots. Could take an hour and 29, not bad, not bad. Great. Grow faster! I find the farming and house building stuff really exciting, Barjo. There's just so much to build. And I don't know, I just love the idea of community that this game represents, even though it's going to be a massive time sink. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm quite nervous about that, especially as this is truly multi-platform. You can play this on a PC, on a Mac, on a Linux box, or you can then take it to an Android tablet or an iOS tablet, no. and it's all the same world. It's too dangerous, Barjo, being able to play a clicky, grindy game like this everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. This is certainly a game I'm going to be taking with me to the toilet. Well, I guess you know it has potential if you can take it to the toilet with you. Me, I'm not personally sold on the grindiness. It's just so slow going, as we mentioned. Yeah, I think grinding is kind of a feature in this game. You need to revel in the grind, let it flow over you and consume you. You need to want to grind. Yeah, I think that's my fear. I don't have time to want to grind. Yeah. There's so much we haven't talked about yet, like the questing and dungeons, the impacts of the player-driven economy on the land and crafting within a guild. But we'll save all of that for our full review when the game goes live. OK, I'm making you a co-owner of this plot of land. You can now access my carrots. <laughs> Star Wars is near and dear to my heart. I grew up on it. It turned me into the geek and gamer that I am. The Dungeons and Dragons and video games I've been playing my whole life, I think, formed and really started with Star Wars. 
Um, so while many people uh, identify Doom as sort of that influence, that first game that, that nailed them, I loved it too. But the game that stood out to me was Dark Forces. At last, the Emperor's War will be filled only with the glory and beauty of decisive victory. The moment when I played Dark Forces for the first time, it, it had this really a, a really cool emotional connection for me. Specifically, there's a scene where you're down looking for these dark troopers down underneath this facility way deep, and your partner, she's up top, and something happens, she radios down to you and says, um, hey, Kyle, there's something going on down here. And Strange is going down over here. Get back here. I mean it. And then it cuts out. The radio cuts out. Oh, no. Kyle, you better look out. I just... And I remember feeling this sense of fear and concern and running full bore back to this level. And it was like way deep down in the mission. And you hear this And then I just remember ducking around the corner, this thing came flying at me, and I was dead, like instantly. And then it was Boba Fett. And I was like, oh my god, that was Boba Fett. Boba Fett just killed me. That's so great. That was like such a visceral experience. It's such a connected experience. And here I was in the Star Wars universe, this universe I loved. So awesome at the time. Very impressive, General. The Emperor will be most pleased. One of the lead programmers on that, a guy named Ray Gresco, is a producer at Blizzard now. And when he came to Blizzard, and he's been there for a long time now, but I was like, you are Don Dark Forces. I'm such a fan of you. You know, <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny. Um, just the, uh, And he worked on Jedi Knight, too, which is also, I loved Jedi Knight as well. But I think that's just how influencing uh, the original Star Wars stuff was. <laughs> it's critical. <laughs> Thank you, Commander. And may the Force be with you. We've rounded up a few of the more interesting mobile releases, so first up, let's take aim with Hitman Sniper. Agent 47 made the jump to mobiles last year with the excellent Hitman Go. And while that game was focused on stealth, this time around it's all about expert marksmanship. Another perfect assignment, 47. No time is wasted as you find yourself perched atop a hill overlooking a very flash and modern compound. It's the kind you'd see in any Bond movie, isn't it? Yeah, you'd see a house like this being built in something like Grand Designs, all concrete and glass, overlooking a small European city. Kevin MacLeod leaning over the balcony delivering a soliloquy. <laughs> After you've had a moment to take in the sights, it's all work and no play as you start taking out high-profile targets, goons, and ducks. Even though this is a pretty small and focused game, it's good to see that it has that hitman sense of humour peppered throughout. This game is every bit as slick and smooth as Agent 47's head, with top-notch menus, music and audio. But I was really surprised that it's all based in the one location. Every mission in Hitman Sniper takes place in this one compound. And you're always in the same sniping position. Yeah, that surprised me. And I would have thought that after you'd taken out three or four targets, the bad guys would have worked out that maybe they should look at renting another house. Maybe a place without heaps of glass windows opposite a perfect <laughs> sniping position on a hill. Well, for me, it was really good progression through the first 10 missions, and I was really into it. But once I realized it was just this one static location, I kind of lost interest. They do mix up the missions with different challenges, such as taking out a number of goons before the main target. And you can have some fun hitting champagne bottles and ice sculptures. But yes, once you've reached a certain level, it is just rinse and repeat gaming. So I'm giving it two and a half stars. Yeah, I think I got over it a little quicker than you. I'm giving it two stars. Textbook hit 47. Rendezvous at the agreed waypoint. Well, from a game that's all about headshots to one that's a real head scratcher, it's The Last Voyage. <laughs> I can think to describe this game, Bajo, is if 2001 A Space Odyssey was a mobile game, it might look something like this. Yeah, that's pretty big praise, Hex. I'm not sure if it quite reaches those heights. <laughs> Maybe not, but it is a game that's a kind of journey, and ultimately you're left to devise your own interpretation of what it all means and what each stage represents. Well, before we get too deep into its meaning, let's talk about what you actually do in the game. 
Across 10 levels, you're put to the test in a series of challenges that involve 3D perception, fast reactions, and puzzle solving. Lining up red lines that interconnect, matching shapes and colours, and travelling through vortexes is what you'll spend most of your time doing. There's some interesting visuals with this game, Hex. There's one level in particular where you're going through warp speed like Star Trek, and I think I saw through time. Yeah, it's all presented in a really stylish and moody tone, complete with a soundtrack that feels like it's from another dimension too. I think the team behind this were heavily influenced by games like Monument Valley, but where that game had a singular vision and something to say, I felt like this was more style over substance. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not as deep as something like that, but I still enjoyed my playthrough of The Last Voyage, if only for that design element. I'm not so sure, it all just felt a bit two-toned to me. It was either black or red, or somewhere in between. Not really something I can look at for long periods of time. I do think it's well put together. I mean, parts of this are just so beautiful, so I'm giving it three stars. Well, when I got to the end of this voyage, I was just confused. I didn't get it, so I'm giving it two stars. As far as dolphin-based games go, there aren't many which I find personally upsetting. But at least once upon a time, we had Echo. When I first sat down to play Echo the Dolphin on my Mega Drive in 1993, I couldn't quite work out what was going on, or what I was supposed to do. You simply swim about, talking to your family, and enjoying life as a dolphin does, doing dolphin things. And leaping into the air was fun. The movement of Echo was so important, you actually enjoyed swimming, which was so rare for underwater games. But then suddenly, this happened. And then, ominous music played. I felt lost and confused in a vast, lifeless ocean. So the journey of Echo began, and it was a tough one. You had limited abilities, a dash attack and sonar for your map, and the deep ocean was not inviting, especially because of all the jellyfish. Those jellyfish. Those jellyfish. I hate them so much. <laughs> With every moment that you spent underwater, you knew you were always losing air as well. And that pressure was frightening. This wasn't just a rudimentary timer running down, forcing you to restart when it was up. This was life or death. There were some parts of this game that were tiresome because it was such a long, arduous journey. And apparently, developer Ed Annunziata made the game very difficult on purpose because he was afraid of kids renting and beating the game in a weekend instead of buying it. And he was right. I tried to do that. I hired it, couldn't beat it, so I had to go and buy it, because I needed to know what happened to this dolphin's family. And the immense challenge of this game was worth it for the payoff. And what a payoff! Echo went back in time, went for a pterodactyl ride, checked out some old ruins, and then, at the end of stage 26, Echo went to confront the game's villain in space, which still had f***ing jellyfish. What a twist! Apparently, an alien species known as the Vortex would come to Earth every 500 years for the harvest, basically using Earth as an intergalactic drive through What a crazy concept for this game. Aliens come to Earth, steal the food, so a dolphin goes back in time to kick their ass. What I like so much about Echo the Dolphin and why it holds so much nostalgia for many gamers is because it was just so different. I loved telling people about the strange new game that I had found. It wasn't like all the other platformers and racing games that we were playing at the time. It had real emotion, and that really stuck with me, as well as a lifelong hate of jellyfish. David Young is a detective. His name starts with the letter D. He also has dreams in the dark, but dark dreams don't die. This is D4. This is a story of a man with a very strange <laughs> fate. My name is David Young, and I'll have the capability to solve even a dead end case. I'll do everything in my power to find this D. <laughs> you really have a death wish, don't you? Who is D? Hex, 
I love it when we get to play games that are a little wacky, but this is certainly at the higher end of the weirdness scale. Yeah, it really is. What are you doing here? And it was another one of those games that I went into knowing nothing about, so I had no idea what to make of it. <laughs> what the f You know, at first I was just like, is this just really, really bad? Or actually kind of brilliant? Well, it's a little confusing. The tutorial sets you up for something quite serious, so you're expecting a kind of straight down the line detective thriller. But as we're introduced to the character of David, the melodrama, the crazy quick time events. You don't have to believe in Sanda, but you really should believe in God. The woman in his apartment who thinks she's a cat. <laughs> yeah, you realize you're in for something a little left of center. <laughs> Hex, I started to get deadly premonition vibes from this. <gasps> Me too. <laughs> The balance of milk and butter you've achieved here. Oh my. Needless to say, D4 is from the very same developer. Hidi Taka, Swery, Suhiro. So, interested yet? Okay, well, let's try and muddle through this crazy journey. David, a private detective living in Boston, his wife has been murdered and he's on the hunt to find the killer. The only thing I do remember are the words that little Peggy whispered as she died. Look for D. But he also has a special gift. Using key items of evidence called mementos, mementos. he's able to dive into specific memories from the past. Yes, but because his wife was murdered in the bathroom, he teleports between these memories through bathrooms. Little Peggy. <laughs> weird that his wife is called Little Peggy. It just seems like more of a name you'd have for your niece or your daughter or something. Yeah, certainly not for your wife. Maybe something got lost in translation there. Yeah, maybe. D4 is currently on PC and Xbox One. We played it on PC and the controls are really simple. This door makes the window creak. On PC, you only use a mouse as gameplay is entirely point, click and quick time based. <laughs> Yes, some of it seems relevant, but much of it also seems pretty pointless. Great job, you figured out that this is a box of documents. Yeah, I feel like this is just a way of making you feel like your eyes are always open. Glad we're on the same page. You're constantly reading each situation, whether the things you notice are of any importance or not. Do you want to watch too? Usually the most important pieces of info have a quick time element to them anyway. You have to mouse over points to reveal these observations before that scene ends or you'll miss the opportunity to discover that detail. You're a United States Marshal. You're transporting a key witness. Another thing worth mentioning is that, like a lot of Japanese games, and again, this was another parallel for me with Deadly Premonition, is the game's weird emphasis on food. Its practical application is that you have to find and eat as much as possible or David will lose energy and pass out. But there are sequences that exist almost entirely separately from any relevance to the story that are just focused on food in a really weird way. No matter how you slice it, Boston has the best clam chowder in the world. I have no basis for comparison. What? I've never eaten clam chowder anywhere but Boston. What is that about? It's all about clam chowder. It's also the game's Boston setting. I picked up on David's Boston accent pretty quickly, but he also makes it very clear on multiple occasions that he's formerly a member of the Boston PD. But it's almost like the developer has this love affair with Boston and has just chosen this game to express it. <laughs> There's a lot of references to classic Boston food, sport, and the city itself. Go Boston, go! <laughs> Nothing says Boston quite like this. David's strange cat girl serves as a kind of in-game store where you can buy more food and other items. It's something you kind of just have to accept and move on. After playing through the tutorial and prologue, episode one sees you on a plane with a strange collection of characters. Excuse me! Shizuki, not a mannequin! Yes, all you know is that you're looking for a suspect whose name begins with, you guessed it, the letter D. But of course, just about everyone you meet has a name that starts with D, so you'll have to focus on building your case from all of your pointing and clicking. The more stuff you click on, the more credit points you get towards your final score. But the game also wants you to stay in character and choose the most appropriate dialogue options for David in conversation. 
Almost anything is possible. Which I didn't really like. I mean, I should be able to play David how I want to play him, not be told I haven't reached full synchronization because I chose the wrong dialogue option. I don't want your life story. I guess it's the game's way of trying to get you to ask the right questions to get the right information. It's about being a good detective. Yeah, maybe. Stylistically, the whole thing is like a really strange dream. From the setting to the strange mini-games you're asked to play, and there isn't a single character you meet that isn't completely bizarre in some way. This is a Yeah, they're either disturbed, completely over the top, or the spitting image of your dead wife. <laughs> David. Little Peggy. Sir, are you okay? Yeah, or they just speak really slowly. You of all people should understand. As far as detective work goes, I didn't get a lot out of D4's approach. and doesn't really involve a lot of input from you in terms of figuring anything out for yourself. I just made sure I was clicking on as many things as possible to get points, but I still struggled my way into episode two. I just didn't feel like I'd done any real discovery. Well, David seemed to be having some kind of revelation on his own. That's it. You're kind of just along for the ride. Yeah, I agree, but for me it was saved by those insane action sequences. Are you serious? As far as quick time combat goes, this was seriously exciting. It was like a Liam Neeson level of airplane combat. Hot I got shamefully sucked in by the weirdness. I just had to see it through. I tried to ride this crazy wave as best I could. But I suppose in a game this strange, it's hard to know when it's constantly drawing your attention to particular things because it's just quirky, or because it's actually going to be relevant to the story later on. Yes, David himself actually lists chewing gum as one of his personal dislikes, yet he's always chewing it. Strawberry flavor. Well, what does it mean? Maybe you're on the mix. Could be relevant, or it could just be part of the game's weird food obsession. Again, these all feel like character notes the dev has included because they're all things that he likes. Mm, I like Boston, I like clam chowder, I like fancy tequila. My game will have all of these things. All of them. Well, I guess only playing through to the game's conclusion will explain things. Maybe. You know you love it. You got the stomach for it. But many who have enjoyed this game have said that their main issue with it is that there are actually only two episodes. Completely un- well, I'm not going to say I didn't have a good time, because it certainly was entertaining in its own way, but this kind of thing isn't really why I play detective games. I want to be more challenged, more involved, not just taken on a crazy ride, so it's two out of five stars from me. I enjoyed this a little more than you, I think, even if only on a superficial level. I just can't help but applaud that level of imagination, and I think the way they handled the action was really clever. No hitting back at the pizza! And, like it or not, I had to see how it ended. I'm giving it two and a half stars. Avant God! Eureka! <sighs> yeah, cave machine's dead. Oh. Look, the last time I saw it, someone had smashed all the high scores. Didn't know what to make of it. What the high score initials? Um, D, I, C? Didn't know what to make of it. Dis. Yeah, that's it. Didn't know what to make of it. Now, if you excuse me, I gotta get back to work. Gotta name all the games for this week. It was Spy Fiction, which was released in Japan in 2003 and later around the world in 2004. And it's our name the game for this week because it was developed by Access Games, the same team behind this week's D4. And next week on the show, the weirdness continues as we jump into the nightmare of Deception 4. Don't forget to tune in to Good Game Pocket, our daily digital show hosted by Nick Boy that recently had its 100th episode. And of course, while we're shooting the news, we are competing for space and silence with the rest of the Good Game office who are all busy trying to make multiple television shows. But of course, it's probably our fault for setting up a shoot directly in the middle of the room. When the game launched... Sam. Just slam everything. Sam. That's fine, mate. Come Don't on. worry about it. We all know you have giant arms. You don't need to prove it. <laughs> And of course, you can find that on YouTube and iView. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Do you wish we had like papers to shuffle at the end? I do wish we had like newsreaders? I suspect that would give us something to do.
<laughs> Look at this thing that we just talked about earlier. <laughs>